Plantar fasciitis. Is it an inflammatory condition? Is it inflammation of the plantar fascia? Well, the name would suggest that this is an inflammatory condition. Yet studies have shown that there's rarely inflammation present, and certainly not after the first acute occurrence. Oftentimes we see images like this that shows tearing and rupture of the plantar fascia. Yet Paul Ingram, a science writer for painscience.com, said this in a very informative article. He said the itis suffix in tendonitis and fasciitis means inflammation. Many people are afraid of running. They're particularly talking about running in this article because between 30 and 70% of runners get injured each year, with quite a high proportion of them complaining of plantar fasciitis. But the tissue is rarely inflamed. Not in the way that we usually understand it anyway. So it may be at first, but certainly not for long. These tend to be the acute phases when injury will occur. Instead, the plantar fascia shows signs of collagen degeneration and disorganization. In other words, scar tissue. So let's take a look at some of the structures involved here. What's usually referred to as the plantar fascia is actually the plantar aponeurosis, which is a thickened band of connective tissue which supports the arch of the foot. And functionally here really it's like ligament because it's connecting bone to bone. So the aponeurosis is the central part of the fascia and then it has slips that extend onto the metatarsals. The medial plantar fascia then is just part of the general superficial connective tissue. And then the lateral plantar fascia is again just continuous with the surrounding connective tissue and it covers the lateral area of the foot. And the most common site of pain then is just on the medial aspect of the calcaneum, shown here pulsing in red. So muscle tension in the calf, particularly coming from soleus through the Achilles tendon here, will pull the calcaneum or heel bone backwards and this will place additional stress along the aponeurosis, causing tension and pressure on this point of attachment, which is our common site of pain. In 2003, Lamont did a study looking at 50 cases and found so little inflammation that they declared that plantar fasciitis is a degenerative fasciosis without inflammation, not a fasciitis. So it would be better to use the more common or more generic suffix like opathy for diseased or osis for condition. Such degeneration is similar to chronic necrosis. So this is like cell death that we see in tendinosis, which features loss of collagen continuity, so a breakdown in the collagen fibers, and an increase in the ground substance of the fluid in the area. This is the matrix of the connective tissue. And an increase in vascularity and the presence of fibroblasts. Fibroblasts, remember, are fiber builders. Rather than the inflammatory cells usually seen with acute inflammatory conditions, like tendinitis. So what causes or what is considered to cause plantar fasciitis? Well, excessively pronated feet or low arches or flat feet, which we see here. There's almost no arch in this person's foot. But equally, they blame excessively high arches on being a possible cause of plantar fasciitis. Repetitive load or long periods of standing. So you can imagine the stress that's being repetitively put through the plantar fascia, particularly during this toe-off phase. They say that it can be the equivalent of up to 180 kilos of pressure just on this plantar fascia during this toe-off stage. Muscle tension. This is one of my recent clients, and they had a tightness in the inverters of the foot, particularly posterior tibialis. And this is after two to three minutes of therapy that the foot position, the heel position, had normalized quite a bit. And this is someone who is a regular runner. Bone spurs are considered to be another common cause, but plenty of people have bone spurs and yet don't have any pain. There does seem to be some correlation between the type of pain people get with plantar fasciitis and the presence of bone spurs, but it's not always coexistent. These bone spurs are oftentimes considered to be very soft, that they're not really true bone. Again, they've been compared to, let's say, comparing these spurs to bone is like comparing tinfoil to sheet metal, that really these are quite, quite soft and can be oftentimes broken up. We also see then if there is weakness in the stirrup system. So the stirrup system consists of four different muscles that is providing lateral support to the foot. So we have anterior and posterior tibialis providing support to the inside of the arch, and then the peroneal muscles or fibularis muscles providing support to the outside. Dysfunction in these will cause excessive stresses through the foot, displacement of the bones and the joints or lack of centration. They won't always, they're not dislocated or even subluxated, but they can be out of position, lacking centration. So when there is arch dysfunction, we see that there is an imbalance between these four muscles. The effect then 
It causes pain mainly in the arch of the foot, mostly around the heel and particularly on the medial aspect of the heel. And the symptoms are most pronounced in the morning. So a lot of people will find when they get out of bed, there's a very sharp stabbing sensation. And this is quite a good visual, I think, for what most people would experience. They oftentimes say it's like stepping on glass when they first get out of bed in the morning. And this can be partly due to the fact that the feet are in a very plantar flex position, either from the weight of covers resting on the feet or if the person is lying face down, simply that the feet are arched backwards. And overnight, they would say, because body temperature is dropping a little bit, tissue tends to cool, it'll tend to become a little bit more rigid, some of the fluid will be reabsorbed from the area, but also more adhesive processes can take place. When you go to suddenly lengthen the plantar fascia by weight bearing, that can add additional stress and cause the pain to be quite acute first thing in the morning. So it can be continuous throughout the day and night, and a lot of people actually find they have difficulty in sleeping, that the pain can be quite intense during the night. Pain can sometimes be experienced during initial activity, but then can reduce when the activity is continued because the warming up of the tissue will sometimes increase the pliability of the collagen within this plantar fascia. Associated tightness of the Achilles tendon is common as well, and we'll talk about that in a little while. Researchers used ultrasonography to show that people with plantar fasciitis have a thickened connective tissue, particularly in the bottom of the feet. So if the plantar fascia has experienced repetitive strain, the body will oftentimes respond by laying down additional collagen fibers, and this is that excessive fibroblast activity that can sometimes occur building extra collagen fibres in response to the tensile stress experienced by the plantar fascia. So how do you test for plantar fascia? A positive test would be dorsiflexion, if this is if it's primarily fascial, the, the foot is stressed, or you can increase the resistance by bringing in a resisted plantar flexion, which is going to pull on the tendinous attachment. So as the client tries to push their toes towards the ceiling, so gastric is relaxed with the knee bent, they're tensioning soleus and a little bit of posterior tibialis, and this will pull on the heel and increase the length or the stress in this area between the heel and the base of the toes or between the calcaneum and the metatarsal heads here. So it's generally treated as a strain or sprain. Most people would actually consider this to be more like a ligament because it is connecting bone to bone. Our first intent would be to reduce the excessive tension that we may find in gastrocnemius, particularly in soleus, and almost certainly in posterior tibialis. A resisted test should then be performed again because sometimes there is just simple ligament pain. This area is painful because of the amount of stress being placed upon it. There isn't any disorganized collagen, there isn't anything else, anything more complicated, and that's why it's considered simple ligament pain. Not that it's not painful, it certainly can be. But once the tension is taken off these tissues, the issue may resolve. However, if it doesn't, if there is some disorganized collagen, some scar tissue in the area, when the repeated test is performed, the client will point to the area that is affected. So a multidirectional friction will be applied for 30 to 45 seconds, and this is done quite gently. It's strong enough to have an effect, but gentle enough to be pain-free. And that's an important point. If it's too light, you're not getting down to the disorganized collagen and can't free up that collagen matrix by working those fibers to separate adhesion between them. But if it's too forceful, it can irritate the tissues, and that will be counterproductive. This simply softens the collagen matrix. It is actually movement that rehabilitates the potential scar tissue in this area. So the client performs active range of motion, and this must be pain-free, and then eccentric loading is performed. At the beginning of this video, we looked at the potentially inappropriate terminology that's used in plantar fasciitis and concluded that it's not an inflammatory condition. So, therefore, the use of anti-inflammatory medication really is not indicated. Where movement is essential to really rehabilitate the scar tissue in the plantar fascia, devices that restrict range of motion can really only be considered useful in the initial acute inflammatory phase. And while stretching is important, we have to understand how to stretch specific. Exercises that lengthen the calf muscles against resistance while they're tensing or under load really prevent effective stretching. Because the muscle is tensing, it's resisting. Weight-bearing movements like the one shown in this image is actually a really good way to strength train your calf muscles, not to stretch them. And in this next image, this even suggests that you can stretch your Achilles tendon this way. Interesting concept. To effectively stretch a muscle, it really must be relaxed, or better still, neurologically inhibited, because that means you're contracting the opposite muscle, or the antagonist, and helping to relax the target muscle, the one you're trying to stretch. Therapist-assisted stretching can be used in the treatment session to show the client how to effectively stretch and differentiate between distal calf muscle stretches and proximal calf muscle stretches, so how to target each end of the muscle, whether it's gastrocnemius or soleus or any of the other calf muscles. 
And most importantly, you can demonstrate stretching of pennate fibers of muscles. So standard stretching routines focus primarily on the principal longitudinal fibers, but they neglect these all important stabilizing and oftentimes tight pennate fibers. These can be effectively targeted by simply changing the angle of the stretch, in this case by inverting or everting the foot as we dorsiflex. With the knee flexed to 90 degrees, soleus can be effectively stretched using the same method that we invert or evert to target the pennate fibers of soleus, either the medial fibers or lateral pennate fibers. To maintain the effects of treatment, it's important that these exercises are practiced regularly. At home, something like a stretch strap or even something simple like a towel can be used to provide assistance. Oftentimes the antagonistic muscle may not be activating enough to get full range of motion and a gentle increase in load by gently pulling on the stretch rope can help achieve full range of motion and help really increase the effectiveness of these stretches. Two second holds and moving in and out of the stretch position also helps to prevent ischemia from developing and ischemia is one of the primary things that will cause irritation on nerve endings and can develop into trigger points. Hope you enjoyed this short video and found it helpful. If there's subjects that you'd like to see us cover in future videos, particular injuries or explanations of anatomical structures, please do get in touch with us either by leaving a note in the comments or you can email us at info at hcd.ie. You can also find information on our training seminars as well as our resource materials such as DVDs and books on our website, it's hcd.ie. If you'd like us to travel to you to provide a seminar in your area, please do get in touch. Thanks for watching.